wherever you're listening in the world, it's a pleasure to welcome you to Israel Cast, the podcast powered by Jewish National Fund USA, your voice in Israel. I'm Stephen Shalowitz, first reminding you that for over 120 years, Jewish National Fund USA has been the premier philanthropic movement for the land and people of Israel. While best known for planting trees in Israel, JNF USA contributes to Israeli life in so many ways, including community development in the Negev and the Galilee, preservation of heritage sites, supporting people with disabilities, and connecting high school and college students to Israel. To learn more and to see how you can contribute, do visit jnf.org. Once again, do visit jnf.org for more. All right, I am absolutely loving the work of Masha Merkulova, the founder and executive director of Club Z. It's an organization that provides teams with a platform to connect to Israel, Jewish history, Zionism, and one another. Club Z is such a phenomenal resource that we wanted to bring Masha on to IsraelCast to share what the group is all about. She joins us now via Zoom from her home in Miami. I think that's in the state of Florida, isn't it, Masha? Indeed it is. Thank you so much, Stephen, for having me. Well, listen, welcome aboard. Again, I just love what Club Z, or for our British cousins, Club Z, is doing. Uh, and we're going to get to that in just a sec. In fact, back in 2021, Isabella Taborowski, who we had here on the program, and who is one of the smartest people I know, by the way, I'm sure you'd agree with that, she penned an article in Tablet Magazine in which she called Club Z, quote, quite possibly the most important American Jewish organization organization you've never heard of. So we want people to know all about Club Z here on IsraelCast, but I think it's really important, Masha, that people know your backstory, your background, before we get to the launch of Club Z and what it's all about. So briefly, you were born in Minsk, and you came to the U.S. in 1992 as a teen. So let's really start with that. Well, but for that, we actually have to start two years earlier. All right. When I'm 16 years old, it's still Soviet Union, kind of already breaking up, perestroika is happening, but still it's a Soviet Union infrastructure. And when you're 16, you go to a passport office and you get your Soviet passport. That is when you become a citizen. And so as I'm standing there, I filled out my application and, um, and I put, so as you know, or I think some of you listeners know, in Soviet Union, nationality was put on every piece of document. So every teacher on a roster next to your name, there was nationality, passport had your nationality, medical charts had nationalities, everything was nationality. So I put Russian because I thought I was Russian. And when the passport lady looked at my mother's name and she said, is this your birth mother? <laughs> yes. She looked at me and she said, oh, honey, you're not Russian. You're a Jew. And um, that's how I learned that my mother forgot to tell me that I'm Jewish. You mean, you mean for 16 years you didn't know you were Jewish? No. Again, it was just not, it was not something that was talked about at home. Um, my mother, as a doctor, was a doctor. She worked you know, probably 80 hours a week. She was either at work or she was sleeping. That was the two states of my mom. And um, yeah, we never even talked about it. Yet at school, they must have known that you were Jewish. In other words, the teachers must have known if, for example, on the roster, it had your name and then your nationality. Again, Masha Merkulova is a very Russian sounding name. Mm -hmm. So... On the roster, I was Russian. Interesting. Okay. So clearly not everywhere you were identified as Jewish, but when you had to get the passport, that's yeah, where yeah. the rubber hit the road. Listen, and I think that what is contributed to what I'm doing now, I did not grow up with, you know, sort of like a baggage of being Jewish or being oppressed or being teased or anything. I grew up as a majority Right. Like I grew up as a Russian. And, and, is, and, and they didn't know what religion you were, because clearly in the Soviet Union, religion was outlawed. Correct. Yeah. Being Jewish is not about religion in Russia, for sure. It's a nationality. So. OK, right. So you go to the passport office. She says, honey, you're Jewish. And then your response is what? OK, put Jewish. Did you I, then I, speak I, to your mother about it? 
Well, what was funny is that she said, oh, no, 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 no. Let's, you know, I could figure it out. I know your mom. Let me put Russian. And I said, no, 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 it's okay. Put Jewish. She goes, you, you don't know what you're talking about. And she, um, she didn't want to do it. And then she got a hold of my mother who said, don't argue with her. She's very stubborn. If she wants to put Jewish, just put Jewish. <laughs> that was the end of it. Did you approach your mother, though, about your identity? Um, you know, it's interesting. Not really. I, I kind of joked about it. Like, mom, did you ever think of telling me? And she just shrugged her shoulders. She said, what is there to tell? And I'm like, okay, that's, that's nice. And that was it. And that was it. So then you yeah. applied to come to the United States. Mm -hmm. And what was that process like for you? So that process, again, it was my mother who was the Jew through that process so we talked about her persecution her her issues you know in school at work in life um but it really it was sort of like she was the matri matriarchs of the family and so and so and, growing up she never talked about the fact that she was persecuted at work or she might have had difficulty in school in her whole background in those challenges that she had faced correct correct you have to understand in Soviet Union, the only identity that was allowed, that was their space was, was the Soviet identity. That was the one and only identity that I grew right. up. So Right. No, I, I know that, but I think it's important uh, as we talk about the work that you're doing. And so you come to the United States. I come to the United States and I want to be American. I want to... I want to be American. I want to learn English. I want to get a job. I want to go to school. I want, you know, white picket fence and a dog and a, you know, I want to live American dream. And something as a, as my <laughs> rabbi once said, it was you, you the guide started to wake up where I signed up my son to a Jewish day school. You know, I had no reason for him to go there because we didn't belong to a synagogue. We didn't go to, the, we did I didn't have a Jewish home or a Jewish life, um, but something in me wanted wanted me to to be near Jews, not wanted him to be near Jews. And so, as he was getting his Jewish education, so so did I. I started getting Jewish education <laughs> with my son, and that was started my Jewish journey, if you will. Oftentimes that happens, and I've heard that from other people, that they might grow up rather secular, then they have kids, and together they begin that Jewish journey. Mm -hmm. No, absolutely. Right. I had, a, I had a, the biggest holiday in Soviet Union was New Year's. And um, for years, I had a New Year's tree. <laughs> <laughs> well, At some well, point, it started to become blue and white, and now we don't have it anymore, and it's like... Well, May Day was also a big day in the Soviet Union as well, wasn't it? Right, but Novi Goat, uh, New Year was the only non-Soviet, non-communist holiday. Right, indeed. So, so, your, so your son is in school, mm -hmm. and then I understand that, that that was the seed for your establishing Club Z. Mm -hmm. And that right. was not meant to rhyme there, by the way. Um, so talk to us about that, the origins then of Club Z and how this whole thing then really started. So Israel came into my world, mm -hmm. into my consciousness in the summer of 2005. And what happened was the disengagement. And I was watching YouTube. That was the only social media um, platform at that time. And so what I was I was watching YouTube and I did not understand what I was seeing. I was seeing Jews dragging other Jews out of their homes and everybody's crying. And there's, there was no way for me to get information. I didn't know anybody to talk to, to ask questions, but that prompted me that kind of planted the seed. I, I want to know what's happening there. And then again, you know, the life goes on and then it's 2006 summer and um, is the second Hezbollah war. Now, I, at that time, was working in a, a hospital. You're a nurse. I'm a nurse, right. I'm a labor and delivery nurse. And in nursing, you have, uh, there's such a 
understanding is travel nursing. So we had three nurses from Ireland and Irish nurses identify with the Palestinians, kind of the underdog. So when I walked into the nurse's station, we had three Irish nurses who did not mind talk about religion, you know, um, salaries or politics. <laughs> These are taboos for Americans nice. and for anybody else. And what I heard was, you know, Israel is horrible, killing Arab children, all of these things. And I had nothing to say. I knew in my kishkas that it cannot be right, but I didn't know what to say. And so it is that shame that prompted me to go and learn. And I hid the books and I hid the videos and I started, you know, listening to to, to lectures and by 2008, by Cast Led, um, I hosted my first event um, under under you know fear of fear of death. I told my family, "You guys better show up <laughs> in case nobody else shows up." And I had 50 people that came to listen to a lecture that I invited somebody to speak about what was happening um, in Israel at the time, and that's when I kind of started my journey of education not just for myself, but for the fact that most Jews don't understand Israel and misunderstand Israel. And by the time my son was in seventh grade, I also realized that unfortunately, the Jewish day schools, the summer camps, the Hebrew schools, they avoid talking about Israel from a perspective of the conflict. We talk about everything else, mm -hmm. Right, but we don't talk about the conflict. So we are releasing students who can talk about cherry tomatoes, but their peers are telling them you've planted your cherry tomatoes on stolen land. And that is not the conversation that was happening. And what our side, the Hasbarak, quote unquote side, was doing is giving kids talking points, giving a quick, you know, a quick, you know, two hour session on Israeli, you know, on Arab Israeli conflict. You cannot do it in two hours. You cannot do it in 20 hours. It's it's a lifetime of trying to understand what is happening and how to how to understand yourself in the role of the Jewish people. And so that, that must have really frustrated you because you know I I always want to know where did the educational system go wrong, right? In terms of, and I'm wondering if you can just kind of address that, Masha. Well, so here's the thing. Again, because I was such a novice in the Jewish education and I didn't know anything. Mm -hmm. So when I learned about uh, Romans taking over and the Roman you know, destruction of the second temple, and then I learned about Masada, I was really inspired by the story of Masada. And I asked my son and his friends, did you guys learn about Masada? And they go, no. I'm like, this is eight years of Jewish education. You don't know about Masada. They're no. So when I asked the teachers, they said, no, we don't teach about Masada because it's so difficult. It's a sad story. Mm. Okay, but do you teach about, they don't teach about anything that could be perceived controversial. And I understand why. These donors are not going to be happy. These board members are going to have a fit. Like, we're stuck in our own framework of trying to please stakeholders. But if you're, you know, it's funny, I come from the world of, of medicine and most of the time, the treatment is quite a bitter pill. And so what we end up being is that bitter pill to people who want to see the world not as it is, but as they wish it to be. And that's where the educational system stood until Masha comes along and tries to shake it all up and just tries to teach people what the real story is and for people to swallow that bitter pill. So let's pick up the story then because I interrupted you, but I'm glad that you shared that, what you just shared. So let's then pick up the story. So your son is not learning what he should be learning. Correct. And not only that, um, there were a few things that happened along the way. Um, one thing that happened, I was at somebody's bat mitzvah, my son's classmate bat mitzvah, and her brother came to me and he was 
you know, I was known as the Israel activist in the community. And he said, Masha, I don't know what to do. And he started showing me photos of a social studies classroom in a public high school where he sit, where he was at. At that time, he was 10th grader. This is an excellent public high school. It's associated with STEM, with Stanford. Um, it's in Silicon Valley. There's, you know, there's hardly bad schools in Silicon Valley. And the classroom was decorated with a huge, the only flag that was in the classroom is by the teachers in the front was Palestinian flag. And on the walls, there was posters with, um, and the occupation, you know, tear down the apartheid wall, intifada, free Gaza. <laughs> this is a public high school. And this is a feeder school from the Jewish day school. A lot of kids go to that school. So we have kids who've gone K through eight. They've gone to Israel trip. They've received, the, their parents have spent hundreds of thousands of dollars by then on their Jewish education, but they don't recognize that this is a problem. Right. Before we can do anything, we need to at least give kids understanding why it's a problem. So that happened. And then my my um, synagogue, which is very pro-Israel, every Shabbat morning, the rabbi is talking how we need to support Israel and the IDF. Um, on the last day of school, the teacher in the Hebrew school, yes, my son is was super Jewy. He still is. He went to Jewish day school and he went to Hebrew school. He he loves Judaism. Um, how old is he, he now, by the way? He's twenty five. Oh, okay. Um, so this was the last class of the seventh grade, and the teacher has showed the kids a film, a documentary movie, which. If you or I will see it, we could see the nuance. We could see kind of like what is happening. But for audience who doesn't know anything, what they will walk away with is that Israeli soldiers shoot Arab children for fun. Um, religious Jews are settlers who, again, shoot Arab children for fun. And the scariest thing in Israel, the scariest place in Israel is the Kotel because there are so many religious Jews. And when I ran to the synagogue and I said, what's going on? They basically said, listen, we have a teacher, she's Israeli, she's wonderful, but we don't have a curriculum. We don't have a program. It's, each teacher does whatever the teacher decides that they want to do. That's ludicrous. That's how it works in vast majority of synagogues and most likely in vast majority of Jewish day schools today in 2023. Um, so they asked me, so I ask, I'm a person of, you know, labor and delivery nursing is very talkless, right? It's like, you tell me what you need and I will see if I can get it for you. And they said, we need a curriculum. So a day and a half later, I had a beautiful curriculum um, that came with training in person in New York and the cost was $50, five zero. And the rabbi said, this is, this is great. This is wonderful. We're going to form a committee. We're going to, you know, consider it. We're going to solicit other curricula. I'm like, okay, great. How long is it going to take? It's like a couple of years. So this is where my chutzpah comes in and my utter just, just, just the, the chutzpah. I'm like thinking to myself, listen, I help women bring babies into this world, right? I teach women how to breastfeed. How hard could this be? I have the curriculum. I look through it. Everything is there. I, I can just do this. And uh, we gathered a group of boys um, and we started meeting and we started learning and then it started growing. And then the JCC gave us space and then we held our first retreat and it kind of started Snow the life snowballed down. as we say exactly and so then take us into just in broad brush strokes where you are and then we'll talk about actually what is the nature of club z and what do you actually do during club z because from humble beginnings you have grown all over the country right i no longer cook <laughs> dinners <laughs> 
for the kids and schlep it to the JCC. Um, so we are in seven locations. We are in San Francisco, Los Angeles, Charlotte, Brooklyn, Manhattan, Westchester, and we're running a pilot in Raleigh. And how do you select these locations then, Masha? We don't. <laughs> um, for example, both Charlotte and Raleigh, I went into the meetings with the with the very determined mothers there saying, we cannot open a location. We don't have bandwidth. We don't have funding. We don't have infrastructure. But we go where we are invited and where people are really ready to, to work to work. We count on the volunteers for the first three to four years to really put in the time and the effort to, to bring the community together. So right. Together. And so if people want to have a club Z in their hometown, they can reach out to you where? They can reach out to, on our website, club Z, Z, <laughs> dot org, or they can email us info at club Z dot org. Okay. Now let's talk about what you're doing at Club Z and the impact that you're really having. And by the way, I just want to say, I, I so salute you, Masha, because you had absolutely no Israel engagement, no Zionist inclination, no Jewish background, except being born Jewish, which is important, growing up and living rather secularly in California, in the Bay Area, and you are one person making a difference. And I have stressed that before here on the program, how it doesn't matter what someone does or what their occupation is or what their background is, they can absolutely make a difference if they have an idea, they have the chutzpah and they have the energy and they have the passion. So congratulations to you on getting this off the ground and having this nationwide program. Now, let's talk about what actually happens at a Club Z and really what is the mission and talk to us about some of the programs that you have. Thank you. Well, thankfully, I'm no longer a one woman show. We have like 20 plus people working here. Um, but I'm going to go from the, I'm going to start from the end. I'll tell you what is the end result. Mm -hmm. Um, for, we just celebrated Purim a week and a half ago or so. Mm -hmm. As we record this, because this isn't coming on air until I think June or something like that. Okay. So on the week of Purim, UC Berkeley uh, Students for Justice in Palestine and um, Bears for Palestine have held their annual Jew Hate Week, also known as Israel Apartheid Week. So what did we do? We brought our students, our high schoolers, to all of their events. They had events in the evenings, most of the days. On Friday, it was an all-day event. So we went there with them. We brought our high schoolers to college, to anti-Israel events, so they can listen and then they can ask questions. And that is the whole point. So the funniest thing is that by the third day, um, SGP got really, I'm going to say scared and uncomfortable. They refused to tell our group where they're meeting. <laughs> so um, they, they try to intimidate the group. They try to follow them and try to take pictures of them. And our kids are like smiling into the camera. Yes, you can take a picture of me, you know, like it's okay. Um, but that is the whole point. The, the worst thing that we do as Jewish parents is that we send our kids to college because of course a child needs to go to college and we give them zero preparation for where inevitably, it doesn't matter what school or what class you're taking. It could be a fashion design, it could be math. It is certainly gonna be English. I'm not even talking about social studies of, you know, history of the Middle East. There will be some encounter with anti-Israel professor, speaker, anything else. And we don't prepare them. So part of the graduation requirements for our students is to attend at least three to four anti-Israel events. Because the first time you go, if you listeners have never been, I highly recommend and the challenge is just breathe through it. <laughs> don't ask any questions. Don't explode. Don't do anything. Just sit there and let it listen to what they're saying. 
The second time they go, our challenge to them is ask a question. Because no matter what the topic is, no matter what who is presenting, we already know everything they're going to say. The third time they go, we want them to ask a question and then a quick follow up. <laughs> and that takes chutzpah because usually you're not allowed, you're not given the space to ask a follow up question. And if they go the fourth time, they're just having fun. It's like walking into the fire. And um they're not gonna be afraid, they're not gonna be rattled, they're not gonna go home and cry because their professor said something deeply anti-Semitic. They're, they're prepared for it. They know how to respond. They know how to respond and they know and how it, to stay calm. And importantly, you're giving them the confidence, aren't you? So that is the, that is, you know, there is a trifecta. You have to have knowledge, you have to have confidence and you have to have a tribe. You need to have a home front behind you that will help you. And that's what Club Z does, is that we have a very academic, very rigorous educational program. Kids meet, you know, every other weekend for two to three hours where they get sometimes lectures, workshops, facilitated discussions, but this is where they're learning the material. Um, they get confidence because we go to these places. <laughs> we do these things. We. We organize our own mini rallies, right? Um, the, um, the Rebbe, the, the book that came out recently, it talked how the rabbi would send out young Chabadnik boys. Shluchim. Stand in the corner, right? Stand in the corner and put a, put a tefillin on, on other Jews. It didn't matter if they put a tefillin or not. It was for the Shluchim to learn how to approach people, to be confident. It's the same thing. We we organize little mini rallies, you know, once a month for kids to understand that it's okay to be outside proudly Jewish, to stand with the Israeli flag or to stand with a poster. In December, in December, um, I was in Iberia and we did the first one, and it was right during the Kanye West was at the height of the news, and one of our teens made a poster that said Kanye needs a rabbi. <laughs> And I thought that was brilliant. That was brilliant. Um, the idea is we need to raise Jews who are comfortable being proudly, loudly, visibly Jewish. We need to come out of our closet. Um, so many people don't tell their neighbors. They don't tell their co-workers that they're Jewish. Why not? People don't even know that they know Jews, even when they do know. <laughs> and um, it that is a very uniquely, by the way, American Jewish thing. Because I don't think people who've immigrated as Jews, we're happy to be Jews here. We're happy to be visible. And I think that is what Club Z brings is the fact that I did not grow up Jewish, but also fully embrace now my Jewish identity. And that is, I'm... I'm comfortable with it. Right. So the kids are meeting every other weekend for several hours during that weekend, presumably on a Sunday or maybe a Saturday night, for example. They're going to lectures. You're giving them information. Uh, first question is, where does this information come from? I mean, I'm assuming that you get wonderful, very erudite people that are speaking to them, but the actual written material, can you talk a little bit about that? So we developed our own curriculum mm -hmm. um, based on, you know, very, very different sources. Um, but yeah, we have our own own curriculum that that that's how we teach. And the curriculum, one of the shifts that I hope we can accomplish, and that is to stop shying away from the word and the action of advocacy and activism. Because we do, we marry, we marry together. We, you know, we're not only going to talk about, you know, what happened during the session. For example, we have, you know, a session on Gaza, right? We're not only going to talk about what happened in Gaza. We're also going to talk about, okay, how do you see Gaza's, you know, narrative being used? When people say free Gaza, what, do you, what does that mean, right? We give them a little bit of a things that they could also engage with and talk and ask critical questions. So 
when they're asked those quick questions, they at least have some understanding. Um, yeah. And then how long are the kids in the program? In other words, it starts at what what grade? Is it eighth grade that it starts? So, right. So ideally, we start, ideally, our ideal student would start in eighth grade and will graduate the program by 11, end of the 11th grade. And then during the 12th grade, listen, during the fall semester, we don't see them because they're doing college apps. Um, and in the spring semester, they become our fellows and that is where they do the activism. So who came to UC Berkeley? It were mostly mostly our 12th graders because they already have senioritis. They already, you know, they already got their acceptance letters. They can miss school and not worry about it. Uh, but also this is where they're going to get their experience of tabling, um, putting on events, um, and, and talking to college students and professors. And the eighth graders, are they also required to go to these anti-Israel rallies? I mean, or, or, the, or the question is, is that at what age do they start going? They're, they're not required, but they're strongly encouraged. And again, they don't go, they never go by themselves. They're always going to go with a group, with the club's staff, at least two. Um, and um, this year we even incur we started encouraging parents to go, to go as well, because parents should see what their children are going to be facing. Um, but by ninth grade, yeah, I want them to go. I want them because the more they go, the more comfortable they're going to be. Um, it's, it's a scary environment when you're sitting in the room by yourself and you think that the world is upside down because everybody says things that you know are untrue, but you're there by yourself. So the first time they go to that kind of fire, they should be with us. And what happens then when the kids go on to college? Can you talk about some success stories, for example, after these Club Z graduates enter university? Sure. So uh, most of our uh, students, what we do is we sort of like pass them on to the college campus organizations, be it Cameron Campus, Hasbara Fellowships, um, Stand With Us, ICC, SSI, Student Supporting Israel. I want them to sort of like take, take these these gems mm -hmm. and they be your leaders. Um, so for example, you see Santa Barbara had a vote. I don't remember what the vote was. Were they trying to adopt IRA definition or were they trying to vote BDS? But it was our alumni there who, of course, college students never plan anything ahead. So usually the heads up is like 12 hours. In 12 hours, we're gonna have a vote. Can you send me you know, 10 speeches that I can distribute? to the to the the talks to the you know language in the particular resolution right. and that's where our students will prepare those speeches and then our alumni will distribute those speeches and we'll you know make sure that the resolution passed or not passed however we want it um they will give you an example we we did an israel trip our first israel trip this past summer and one of the things that we did is we brought kids to Hebron. We had a wonderful tour uh, with the spokesman for the Jewish community. And then we had a conversation with a representative from Breaking the Silence. That is a violently anti-Israel group, which is challenging for us because it's hard for us to challenge somebody who served an idea. Who are we? We're, you know, we're American Jewish kids who've never been anywhere as far as, you know, army. But when Breaking the Silence came to a college campus, actually it was again, um, UC Berkeley in the fall, I had three alumni there who went on the trip for her Breaking the Silence and who were able to refute, you know, their lies in front of the large audience. And that is the that is the key is not by yelling at somebody, but by asking good, thoughtful questions that will expose the speaker as as a fraud. That's very powerful. And polite. <laughs> well, that's the thing, because once you start with a shouting match, it goes nowhere. 
Correct. right? And people need to have the facts. Richard Kemp, Colonel Richard Kemp, who is one of my personal heroes, whom we'd love to get here on Israel Cast, by the way, um, is very active with Club Z. And I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about his involvement. Well, he calls it Club Z. Let's get that out of the way. Um, <laughs> um, listen, I, I met Richard in 2019 in mm -hmm. Israel, and I invited him to speak at our conference. And when he came to the conference and he understood what we are all about, um, he's become our biggest, our biggest friend who is tirelessly. So speaking of Israel trip, I asked him, listen, would you happen to be in Israel? Could you come and speak to the kids? Mm -hmm. He cleared his schedule. The man is very busy. He was with us on the bus the entire time. So um, he, he is an inspiration and really if only Jews were just as passionate about Israel and Zionism as, as Richard Camp, who is a non-Jew, we would not, you know, we would not have a problem, but yeah. Can you also talk a little bit about really what's going on on campuses today? Because, you know, yes, there's BDS, but then there's also non-BDS, right? And so I'm just wondering from your vantage point, if you can give us a little bit of the lay of the land and what you're hearing really is going on. Mm. And by the way, and let me also just add to that high schools as well. Right. So if I could, if I may start with high schools. Sure. Um, most people that are not in California have never heard of the big boogeyman. It is, it's scary and it's coming and it's called ethnic studies. And that's what people need to understand. Listen, when I went to school um, many, many years ago, I took a course in ethnic studies and it was great. We learned about different ethnicities and what they bring to the to the rich American way of life. Um, unfortunately, ethnic studies is a is of today is what is critical race theory. Um, and explain and explain for our global audience what critical race theory is. Um, critical race theory in our in our little neck of the woods is a way to look at life through two classes of people, oppressed and a, an oppressor, a victim and and again, somebody who oppresses, uh, white and not white. And so in this case, in ethnical studies, model curriculum, which is based on critical thinking, um, there are four groups of people who are identified as oppressed and everybody else is not. So to give you example, it is uh, Blacks, Latinos, Pacific Islanders, and Asians. And who is Asians? Are they Chinese? No. Koreans? No. Vietnamese? No. Indians? No. Who are Asians? Arabs. Jews in that classification are white people. So it is a deeply anti-Semitic curriculum. It's also anti-American curriculum. And it has been written by academic activists who have dedicated their lives to bringing down, yes, it's, it's it, to bringing down America, America's values. Um, and we are the, you know, Jews are seen as, as white capitalist. Oppressors. Oppressors, correct. And so, so in California, so in California, it is now a requirement to graduate high school. Um, I think it, so it was enacted in 2021 and I think it's gonna start in 2023 or 2024. Um, and that means that every single kid that is in public high school, which is most kids um, have to take that course. Um, there are many now, many organizations now who are working on fighting it. But again, unfortunately, we're we're behind the ball, and it, it is something that I wish Jews were not afraid of a fight, because we could have fought it early on. But we were trying to appease, we were trying to be nice, and you know, it just it doesn't work sometimes. And it's a coming attraction for other states. 
Well, the other states already said whatever is passed in California is going to be enacted in the rest of the 49 states. Well, except for your state, for example, I don't think like a state like Florida or maybe Texas or more conservative states would would go that route because it's a very woke curriculum. So correct. So again, because it's not called critical race theory, it's called ethnic studies. We have to be careful to make sure to educate the legislatures that it's it's the same thing. Is it the exact same curriculum, though, that is going to be transported from state to state? Or will each state enact its own ethnic studies program? Oh, not only that, each school and each school district has a choice of which which curricula they would like to take. So there are organizations that are putting out ethnic studies curricula that are called constructive versus critical. So the constructive ethnic studies, that is what we want. That's the diversity. That's, you know, what do the immigrants bring to this country? What, you know, what are, yes, let's talk about difficult issues. Let's talk about discrimination, but let's also realize where we live. Again, I'm a deeply patriotic American. I'm grateful to this country. And are there issues? Of course there are issues. There were people who refused to talk to me because they said, you don't speak English. And that was just a few years ago. Trust me, I spoke English. Your um, English is mighty fine in my book, yes. <laughs> thank you. So yes, there is racism. Yes, there are bigotry. But is the government out to get me because I'm a Jew? No, it is not. So that's the difference. Right. So that's happening in the high schools. Right. And everyone in earshot in the United States needs to know about that. And then talk a little bit about the college experience. So because this kind of education or malpractice of education, if you will, have been happening for years, we have most of the students who are predisposed to do hatred. I'll give you one example. Um, a friend of mine, her friend's daughter was at University of Albany. She was a freshman. She lived with in a dorm with it's a suite with five other girls. She mentioned she didn't hang up Israeli flag. She didn't put up Israeli map. She didn't even put a mezuzah on her door. She mentioned that she was in Israel on a vacation. She had to be evacuated with the school campus police because of how vicious the girls became. They made her life miserable. So you don't have to, you know, one of the things that parents could, you know, tell me, listen, I want my kid to know who they are, but I don't want them to be activists. I want them to just, you know, study and, you know, have a, have a good time. Yes, if they will hide the fact that they're Jews from all of their friends, they never go to Hillel, they never go to Chabad, sure, great. But if you want your kid to be their authentic selves and not hide the fact that they're Jews, your kid is going to have a hard time. So you need to, you need to prepare that for them. Um, one of the things that happened, actually, it, it, it was a repeat. It happened um, at Berkeley, but it also happened at UC, um, at Santa Clara University a couple of years ago, where, you know, our alumni, in this case, both times, it were young ladies who were very petite, you know, like five, one, hundred pounds wet, and they would approach the SGP students, either tabling or just to talk. And they students would say, for justice in Palestine. Yeah. Students for justice in Palestine. And they were told, we're intimidated by you. We're not going to talk to you. <laughs> like, really? Like, it's a bit little, you know, you're intimidated by them. But of course they are, because they're intimidated by intellect and by not able to answer simple questions. Again, congratulations to you and the entire team, because, again, you're instilling these values, confidence, wisdom, courage amongst these young people so that they are equipped to go out into the real world and to stand on their own two feet. And that's a beautiful, beautiful thing that you and the entire team indeed are doing. And one thing I think that is so interesting um, is this whole notion that not only you, but others that came from the former Soviet Union are very active in combating 
Jew hatred and combating anti-Zionist rhetoric, anti-Israel rhetoric, because you know what propaganda is all about. You grew up with it. You know what brainwashing is all about because you grew up with it. I did not grow up with it, although as I mentioned before we started rolling, I have a China background. Uh, I was educated as a China specialist, as a Sinologist. I lived in China for many years and I could see it firsthand and I see the way that it works here. And I see it even in American politics in the election cycle. I know I'm not supposed to get political on this program and I'm not, but it happens on both sides of the aisle. And you can see it because if you've been educated to it, or in your case, and those that came from the so former Soviet Union, you grew up with it. You can identify it a hundred miles away. And so you're trying to nip it in the bud as it relates to Israel and the Jewish people and Kola Kavo to you and uh, all that are working in that space. Thank you. I, you know, it's, it made me think I'm, um, I'm allergic to standing in lines, right? Like if I see a line, I just can't, I can't. I spent 18 years standing in lines. I'm not going to be standing in line. But the other thing I think a lot don't of come people... to by the way, don't come to Trader Joe's here on the Upper West Side in New York if you don't want to <laughs> stand in line. <laughs> no, I'm like, no, but you, do, line. but you do your shopping while you're in line. So it's killing yeah. two birds with one stone. Anyway, <laughs> I'm joking, of course, but carry on. But the other allergy I think we have is allergy to to propaganda, yeah. to to BS, if I may say that. And yeah. and we sniff it out and it's so obvious, right? We we have not lost our ability to to think critically um and to ask questions and to ask we i have to say we do have a little bit of a you know we we could just shrug our shoulders and say listen i'm not from america i just want mm -hmm. to understand what is happening here right uh, which is probably harder for our, you know native born americans so. well you see the the thing is though masha is that you grew up without the freedoms and you now have the freedom. And so you treasure that. Whereas I think, I mean, believe me, I also treasure my freedom, even though I grew up here, but I don't think everybody does here in this country. And we don't really realize how good we have it. Listen, again, I, I understand freedom of speech. and expl For example, somebody who, um, the, the, the Goyim TV guy who mm -hmm. used to live in, Northern California, he now lives in Florida, and he did this whole horrible attack on a Chabad of Orlando where he was yelling at people. He has a right. He has a right to do, we don't, we don't have to like it, right? If I lived in Orlando, I would have showed up with my, you know, Israeli flags and stood there because I also have a right. But that is the point. The freedoms that we have should be exercised. They should not be taken for granted. And um, if we don't exercise them, that means somebody else will, and they'll shout us down. So, Marsha, the kids that were in the original cohort of Club Z will invoke yeah. Richard Kemp there. Um, and those early classes, presumably they're young, young adults, adults right? Now. They're young adults right now. They're in the working world. Uh, yeah. They might be parents themselves of toddlers no. and well not yet no 24 25 so not yet okay not yet maybe some of them yeah. like to start young but let's yeah. let's just say they are young adults certainly they're working or they're in graduate school right now and i'm just wondering what's their experience like um so what is interesting is that we don't have anybody one of the if I may go back for just a minute, yeah. one of the things that puzzled me when I was first starting to realize that we have a problem, one of the things that puzzled me is why do Jewish students, Jewish kids become anti-Israel? Because I was watching kids who would come on college campus and they'll talk about how they want to be pro-Israel and how they're going to stand up and, you know, one quarter at Berkeley or one semester somewhere else and they're sitting, you know, on a plaza with a Palestinian flag. Um, so I'm happy to report that none of Club Z graduates <laughs> have become anti-Israel, which is a big deal. It, it, it is a big deal. You don't want your kid to come home on Thanksgiving or Passover 
and accuse you as a parent of, you know, you didn't tell me, you're a colonialist, you're an oppressor, or you support the apartheid, you know, regime. Um, and what are they doing? Uh, they're doing all sorts of stuff. We have a lawyer, we have people in grad school, school we have people who are already working. Um, what is interesting is one of our one of our students, former students, reached out, um, and he's he sent us a a copy of the email that he sent to his HR, um, saying that you know you're doing all of these uh, diversity, inclusion. equity, diversity, <laughs> equity, and inclusion, right, yeah. which is the very popular thing to do right now. Which is sort of like again, it's a it's a it's form a of a, it's a form of a critical race theory. In, in the workplace and um but he he likes to be funny and he likes to poke bears and so he said where are the jews you know what's happening with us here um which he got a he got a um you know a reply from the hr like oh you're so right you know would you like to 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 do a presentation which he did it's good for him absolutely but, and i think good for those colleagues of his too no, absolutely. Right. One thing I do want to tell you, you know, I think most of the people by now are familiar with this map, uh, disappearing map of Palestine, it's the white and green kind of four rectangles. Do you know what I'm talking about? I don't actually. Ah, so this is something that anti-Israel educators do quite often in high school, in college. And in the workplace. So I had somebody reached out to me who said her coworker, and that, this was an investment bank. A coworker hung that map in their cubicle, and uh, she was trying to figure out how to deal with it because it's a deeply political thing. You're not supposed to have politics at work. Uh, so the HR got involved and took it down. But it it took three to five months. I don't remember anymore. Uh -huh. So it's everywhere. But what people need to understand is that the experience of anti-Semitism of 20 and 30 year olds is much more intense than of people who are 50 and 60 year olds. Yeah, it's the it's the world we're living in right now. And that's the beauty of what you're doing to really help to educate the the little ones. I shouldn't say the little ones, but to educate kids, right? Mm -hmm. Beginning in eighth grade, you're what, 13, 14 years old and to uh, arm them with the facts, because at the end of the day, it's really about facts that can help support your identity. One final thing before we really begin to wind down, because you've been so generous with your time, Masha, I want to go back, though, to what we started talking about at the very beginning, which is how... Um, I don't want to say how Hebrew schools and day schools have failed kids when it comes to Israel education and when it comes to Zionism, but have you seen any changes since you've begun Club Z? I have seen a lot of positive changes since 2021. Mm -hmm. So I think the last war in Gaza in May of 2021 woken up a lot of adults. Because for the first time, it was for the first time that adults were reaching out to me and to Club Z in general with asking, oh my gosh, I'm seeing my friends posting anti-Israel things on, on, on social media and I need to reply and I need to have conversations. And I think finally people understood what our kids live with every day. And so I'm seeing a lot of the federations, a lot of the synagogues and organizations, they're wanting to do something. The parents are asking them to do something. So they they are starting to talk about my one word of caution is don't accept a Band-Aid for a hemorrhage. This cannot be solved by a one-day Israel celebration, right? Israel U is not a one-day thing. Israel education is a, it's a commitment of time and, and brain and resources. Yeah, and I'm not and I'm not doing a gratuitous shout out for our podcast here, Israel Cast, but I think whether it's our podcast or any other one, for example, yeah. listen regularly and educate yourself and read books and go to discussions, go to lectures. And I think importantly, do what you did at the very beginning, invite people into your home or into a venue and get speakers. Mm 
where there can be dialogue and people can learn. And that's really what it is. It's, it's really uh, an ongoing educational adventure, isn't it? And the truth is many of the amazing top notch educators and speakers will come for free. Yeah. They'll come for very inexpensive because this is their life mission. This is what they want to do. They want to fix this. They want to bring the Jews together. We want to raise a new generation of strong, proud American Jews. So it's really not that difficult. One of the questions that our parents and teens ask, they're like, you know, how do you guys find these amazing people and why do they come? We just ask. <laughs> we ask and come. <laughs> It's not that difficult. And also there's not that many of them. So we end up all knowing each other. Well, we're going to have to tap into you, Masha, to get some of these wonderful people here on Israel Cast. We've been very fortunate with our guest list, and we're so grateful that you were able to join us on this episode. And before we push off, I ask, I'm going to ask you what we ask all of our guests. What does Zionism mean to you, and what are you most proud of when it comes to being a Zionist? And of course, I'm asking that because, as you know, Jewish National Fund USA has a whole campaign called Conversations on Zionism, Reclaiming the Narrative. It's meant to show the beauty and the inclusivity of Zionism. And again, I know you know about it because you were part of that program. So talk to us about what Zionism really means to you then, Masha. Zionism for me is about justice. It's a correction of a wrong. And that's, again, where my Soviet upbringing comes in, where we were, what, what did Soviet Union do well? They raised generations of justice warriors. Not social justice, justice warriors, right? So for me, when I finally learned the history and the story of Israel, it was miraculous. It was mind blowing. And I did. I shouted about it from the rooftops, from, from my car to my coworkers to everybody that I became that crazy person who would always talk about Israel. So to me, Zionism is the restoration of justice. We were not exiled from our homeland. We were ethnically cleansed. There was no exit sign, right? Romans didn't say proceed please to the exit. No, we were we were massacred and 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 we were ethnically cleansed. And finally, after 2000 years, we're the only indigenous people in the history of the world to reclaim our ancestral homeland and to, to put our flag in our soil and say, this is ours. All right. Masha Merkulova. We're going to leave it right there. This has been such a fascinating and really inspirational conversation. Thank you for all that you do. We would love to have you back to share more stories about Club Z. But for the moment, really just thanks so much for joining us here on Israel Cast. Stephen, thank you so much for everything that you do for GNF and for the Jewish people. It's really been a pleasure. Thank you. Oh, oh, thank you very much for that. And of course, we'll have info about Masha and Club Z on the show notes page of our website, jnf.org slash IsraelCast. And before we move on with a little housekeeping, I just want to remind you what we were just talking about, that Jewish National Fund USA believes the time has come for us to reclaim the narrative, take ownership of the word Zionism, be proud of it, and show the world how beautiful, inclusive, and inspirational it really is. So do join Jewish National Fund USA's Conversations on Zionism, Reclaiming the Narrative. It's that series that will educate, engage, and inspire on the true meaning of the word Zionism and reclaim its true meaning in all its glory. I have learned a ton from these conversations, and you'll get to hear Masha again on them. So do log on to youtube.com forward slash Zionism Studio. Studios. Once again, youtube.com forward slash Zionism Studios. I know you're going to love them. Now, as for Israel Cast, we do release new episodes of the show every other Wednesday. And just so you never miss an episode, subscribe to us wherever you get your podcast. It's so easy. Simply search for Israel Cast. And don't forget to rate and review us because that really helps with our rankings, which in turn make it easier for more people around the world to find us and to hear from extraordinary and inspirational people like Masha. Or you can always enjoy the show by visiting us at our website. I hope you've got it by now. It's jnf.org slash IsraelCast. Now it takes a whole mo shop to put Israel Cast together. And for that, we thank Vivian Grossman, Dara Shapiro, J.D. Krebs, and Ellie Kadrin. Our editors are Jay Rothman and James Casada from Miratone Studios right here in the very heart of New York City. And the music that you hear at the top and tail of the program, it's titled My Eden. It's by the very talented Rafi Malkiel from his album Water on the Tzadik label. 
Israel Cast is indeed powered by Jewish National Fund USA, your voice in Israel. For more info about JNF USA, do visit JNF.org. And if you'd like to write to us with story ideas or just to say hello, I know I'd love to hear from you. So do email us at IsraelCast at JNF.org. Once again, our email address is IsraelCast at JNF.org. Meantime, I'm Stephen Shalowitz. Thanking you for tuning in and looking forward to having you join us on future episodes of IsraelCast.